thank you guys for um, being here today. I'm super excited about this topic. Obviously, as a career advisor, I love talking about the skills that individuals can, can, can cultivate to become successful as a data scientist. So um, I guess, do you guys want to start out and share a little bit more about your backgrounds? Um, yes. It's nice to be here. Thank you for the, the warm welcome. Uh, my name is Keith Myers Crum. Uh, briefly, I come from a physics background, so uh, my undergraduate work was in physics, and then I did my PhD in particle physics. And over the course of my PhD, I realized, like, so I was working on the statistical analysis part of an experiment. I realized I like that more than like the actual physics stuff itself. So I transitioned more towards data science. So I spent a year as a consultant, a data science consultant, and now I work at Civis in our data science R&D group. So I'm a team lead with a few uh, wonderful team members, and we spend a lot of time coding up workflows, uh, primarily in Python, sometimes in R, uh, for clients and also for our data science platform. So Civis started um, right after the Obama campaign. Our CEO was the chief data officer uh, for the Obama 2012 campaign, so him and a bunch of data scientists started our company using some of the insights they learned from the campaign around targeting and around like how to do quantitative social science in a in a um, you know business and political setting. So we started there, and now we've transitioned towards turning all the stuff we've learned into tools and into our software platform, our data science platform that we try to sell to data scientists. So that's that's my road down. Um, so my name is Carolyn Phillips, and you're going to hear uh, often a common refrain of, I came from physics. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I came from a lot of things, one of which was physics. Um, I was uh, math, I worked as a nuclear engineer for some years. Um, then I got a PhD in physics and computing, and I was working as a research scientist at an Argonne and National Lab, which is the Department of Energy uh, lab about 25 miles west of here. And my work was getting more and more data science-y, and I was finding the physics-y chemistry part of it to be less and less interesting. I was like, let's go with that. Um, so I uh, started working at a startup about a year ago uh, and uh, uh, using machine learning to find financial market manipulation. Um, and then I now work for Capital One. Um, and we work on, we have uh, technologies we're standing up where we manage tens of millions of customers' information. And when you're, anytime you're talking tens of millions of data points that need to be handled very carefully, there can be a lot of opportunity for using machine learning and data science and predictive models to do it correctly. Um, and one of the reasons I like that Capital One is an interesting company is they have been doing empirically information and data-based decision-making going back to the 90s, so they have a long history of incorporating uh, data-based thinking and prediction methods into their product from the very start. Thank you so much, and my name is Essen Rahman. I'm a data scientist at IBM. Particularly inside IBM, I work in business analytics division. So I'm part of the innovation labs where our responsibility is not just to develop a product or new features, but also, also with in working with clients and getting the problems, new aspects which no one has covered so far. My major aim at IBM is to develop business analytical applications which can be used for citizen analysts. Analysts like who don't know machine learning as such, but they really want to explore the data and get some insights which they can use in normal business operations. My background is I did my undergrad in information technology, and after which I was working with IBM in global business services as an advanced analytics and optimization consultant. My major assignments were working with telecom companies for churn prediction, customer segmentation to banks, unstructured data, and finding out different problem statements which they can use for. After that, I did my master's from Northwestern. It's in analytics, analytics specifically for 15 months, and after that, I came to IBM. So my current work these days revolves around a lot of using weather data, which IBM recently acquired the weather company, or using geospatial data. So how could weather, geospatial information be used together with an, all this data which clients have and how we can come up with better insights specific to time and location. So that's what I'm working these days on. Thank you so much, Ashton. Great, thanks. 
So I have a few prepared questions that I'll ask these three, um, but we'll definitely leave enough time for you guys to ask your own questions towards the end. So the first one I have here is, um, could you name the top three things professionals need to cultivate in themselves to prepare for a successful and fulfilling career in data science? Okay. <laughs> Why just top three? <laughs> Why not more? Okay, just let me list first of all, as like Zach and everyone I've been seeing here is that as a scientist, you would always have this curiosity and I would say sense of wonder. Why is this happening this way? What the people are saying, can I actually find out from within the data? So this curiosity of going back into the data and looking for answers instead of just believing in people and then having this urge to see that all these data points, all those business aspects which I'm coming from, different people, does data sound like that? Do I actually, people like who collect all those different data points and all those different perspectives and bring them together on a table based on the data, that's something which I feel like is number one, the sense of wonder. Number two, I would say persistence. To be honest, is like how much can you stick with the problem in this real world? We actually have a famous quote which says that data doesn't give out secrets easily. You have to torture it before it starts confessing something. <laughs> so in this big data world, where if you have tons of data, you go to a stakeholder, a client, they'll give you a lot of data, but there is a very small portion of data which might be useful for your problem. So cleaning this whole data, it's a frustrating task, and usually takes a lot of time. Usually it's, people say it's a 20 to 80 ratio. 80% 80 of the time is spent on data preparation, and mostly people don't like doing that. But as a data scientist, the more time you spend, the more you sweat on that side, the better you will find out good insights. So it's this persistence of sticking to that issue, and then finding out those insights. And the, more, the second most important thing which I feel within persistence would be, okay, I know there's an insight which is really useful. When you take it to the stakeholders or to the management, I'm not sure the first thing they will agree with you, they'll say, no, you are wrong. And they can get personal to you. They can really push you hard on that, saying, what are you saying? Are you crazy? These things happen. So keeping up with all those insights or all those recommendations which you have, and then sticking and convincing the other side, that's the ultimate test. And that's what makes it a special or extraordinary data scientist who can do that, who sits in the room and sees everyone is blank and takes a whiteboard, explains this whole thing, and at the end, everyone says, I know what you're saying now. That's something which you would like from a good data scientist. The third thing which I would actually would be sense of wonder, persistence, and the third thing which comes right to my mind would be ultimate communicator, I would say. In a research blog, you will just write a good report, a research paper, and you're done. But as a data scientist, you would actually feel like it's a good visualization you have to bring on top of what you're saying. You need to be having a more business language when you're talking to non-technical people, you need to understand and bring out less complex things which people can understand and take it from you and start using them. A data scientist can give you good recommendations, but until they're applied in the business and they make some change out of it, they won't be useful. So a data scientist would actually have this urge to make sure I can communicate my insights, whatever I've done, and make sure the business starts following them. So that would be the third major thing which I will hold on. Thank you. So those were three very good things, and I agree with all of them. I'm gonna hit one point a little harder, which is to me the difference between a good data scientist and a really good data scientist is communication and politics. You probably don't hear that very often. But and what I mean by politics is not like, you know, figuring, you know, not politics, politics, but um, when you're working in, when you work as a data scientist, you're inherently working across the business, working with all different kinds of people. What is this data to this person? What is their perspective on this data? What, what is the, the, the detail of this data that, that is going to bother them? Uh, how is, what, what about this person? What detail or what facet of this data set? You know, if maybe the, um, the software person on your team is concerned with uh, the computational time it's going to take for a data to go through the pipeline. And maybe the business person is going to not like to hear that people are messing up their social security numbers all the time. Uh, you need to be able to communicate with each of these people, understand their pain, uh, their perspective on the data, and deliver to them sometimes messages they don't want to hear. Uh, people don't want to know that data, they, they've delivered up to you this beautiful data set, and they don't want to hear that that data set has issues in it. But you are, you're the person who needs to communicate that to them and understand uh, 
what matters to the different people in a room that you're talking to about data. Data is very, uh, data is a very like personal. It's like it's a, it's, you know, all the truth is in there, and you are the truth teller. And sometimes that means you're going to tell things about their, them about their data that they were not wanting to hear. <laughs> yeah, I think that both of all the things you guys have said kind of ring true. I think communication was that was one of mine as well. Uh, <laughs> the um, like well, one of the things I think that's really important that is I, that makes the job more fun for me and fulfilling, and I think is a, an important skill is like this um, ability to, to to teach yourself new things, and dive into something new. Um, and I'm sure we'll be talking more about like the constant, you know, alphabet soup of new tools that's always coming out, and that it's very hard to keep up with it. But the the biggest thing that the biggest trait I found that's that's made my job fun and fulfilling and I think is maybe maybe like decent at it is this willingness to, to try problems that I've never seen before, technologies I've never seen before and, and be willing to you know humiliate yourself for a while before you like figure something out. I think is um, that's like one thing I wanted to add that I don't I don't know if that got touched on, but everything else I agree. Awesome. So regarding what makes a successful data scientist um, how do expectations of new data scientists often differ from the reality of commercial work? Um, so, I, I actually requested that this question be added uh, because because <laughs> it's like this is a setup. Yeah, this is a setup. Um, the one thing that is like a constant refrain from new people entering data science that I hear, and I'm curious to hear if you guys share this, but um, a lot of people expect to like get hired and then do deep learning and not have to do anything like just only do sexy stuff right and somebody else takes care of all the crap and there's actually like kind of a, an inversion that is really important which is like you know it's a job right so there's like you have to make money at some point and that means there's going to be lots of stuff that needs to happen that nobody wants to do and you have to be willing to do it and kind of contrary to what your expectations might be, like that's the stuff that sets you up to later do sexy work, right? Like when you get to, when you're in charge of a project and all of its warts and you've dealt with all the data cleaning, no one else is qualified to do the cool modeling and all the fancy, you know, deep learning or whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, you know, you won't get to do that stuff unless you do the, the, the crap in front of it, um, which is a, an, a reality that I think some people are surprised by when they start working. I absolutely agree with that, and to build off of that, um, everybody wants to come in and do the biggest, best, most cutting edge model that's currently being talked about in the coolest, newest platform that everybody's talking about, and that's not most of data science. In fact, most of the, most, the, the, the actual model that you end up using at the end is gonna be worth like 0.5% of your performance. Understanding your data, cleaning your data, determining what the correct features are in your data, the grungy work of truly becoming deep, deep friends of the data set is gonna get you 30, 40% important performance improvement. And that's the actual work of being a data scientist. So sometimes you get to do the sexy stuff, but most of the time you just have to like, just really love truly getting to understand the data set. So my perspective would be building on this thing, like most of the graduates which go out from college and come to a company, they would expect everything is very much streamlined, right expectations, clear goals, very good data set. This doesn't happen in reality. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, first of all, unrealistic expectations, very bad timelines, worst data you could have ever think of. <laughs> and then you don't have a good communication with the team and say, what am I doing over here? But that's reality, that's what you need to understand. You won't get time to build a perfect model, you need to get a solution out. You need to understand that I can work on accuracy for like a week or two weeks, but you don't have time because during that time you can do much more work than just accuracy. So realistic, realistically speaking, I would say when you go out to a new company, you need to understand the fact that iterative process, which just actually talked in this morning, I really liked it, was that you might start out with a simple model, you will have a constant feedback and discussion with your team or with your stakeholders, and that's what is important. Constant feedback, understanding what's the problem, trying to 
limit the scope of the problem and explaining them in a very clear cut way that you, what you're asking for is a big ocean, I can just build a small lake for you in this, in this time frame and that's what is important and that will lead you to the next step which is that when you sit in the discussion, make sure you contribute something. You should be a quantitative knack who can, when there's a formula being shown up, you can just look at that formula and say, what could be the possible scenarios? Where can I use it? What is the problem? And if you kind of speak up at those times, that will make, actually make you a big shot and probably you'll actually stand out. So what I would say is keeping it simple, starting with simple process, giving out constant feedback, communicating well, and at the end, whatever you do, Make sure it's explained and not for non-business or non-technical audience, which is basic business people. You can explain it in a very simpler term, and they can understand a small bit of it and start using it. That what that's what I would show, what I would say to you guys. You don't have to always come with a complex mathematical equation, write it in a report, and send it to your manager. He won't like it at all. You'll actually have to come up with some good visualizations. Sometimes over the phone, you have to explain them with good examples so people can understand what you're trying to say and they can start using those things. That's what I would recommend at this point. Excellent. Chairman, before you proceed, I hate to interrupt, but I think our audience here want to listen to some hard skill. So first question you ask, the top three skill. I think our son, you set up a very good tune for about you know, the general skill we need. But I don't see any difference from that to other jobs. We want to hear some hard skill, like Python or S or whatever, because a lot of them are entering the industry from another field. So what you are talking about are advanced skills already. So we want to hear something so basic. Just let me tell you, when we talk about data scientists or extraordinary data scientists, I would expect everyone who is a data scientist would have those Python skills, those programming skills which uh, Zach talked about, programming skills, that's what the, would be the little extra on the top of those skills which can make you differentiate. That's what we're talking this talk. That's what I think we're talking about. But at the end, I can answer a question. After we dis discuss these questions, I can t let you know at the end what is the industry looking for. I would do it at the end, I promise you. Also, I think this is a, a good moment to underline, like the last question was what's the difference between expectation and like the actual job? And the actual job is more, like you said, it sounds like other work because it's it, it is like other work. Like a lot of what you have to do day to day is work with colleagues and deliver for a business purpose and understand the business question behind the problem. And like, yeah, you need to be able to write code, you need to be able to understand statistical inference, and you need to be able to build models and all that. Um, but yeah, that's like kind of baseline expectation for a data scientist. But like, really, the day to day job is communicating with others and, and understanding the business problem at hand. And, you know, in academia, you probably would spend more time writing the code and building the models and also like doing grant proposals. But, like, actually being a data scientist is a lot like other jobs. And I think that's an important, like, uh, an important point to, to try to convince people. Like, if you want to go into this, like, it's great. You get to write lots of code and do lots of math and build models. But like you'll also be working with with colleagues like you would in another you know in another field. Um, so, I have been taught to stop using the phrase hard skill and soft skill because uh, this implies a hierarchy of difficulty, and that hierarchy of difficulty is false, false, false. The learning I, I'm going to just make a, a guess that everybody in this room is capable of learning languages and the tools, but having the ability to work in a workplace and do the politics and the communication and the communication and that and like working in the uncertain environment where people say we want a model and they don't know what of, that is often the more difficult of the skills. So I haven't quite worked out what, I, mean, I might call them like the quant skills and the uh, Inter the social skills, but I try to stay away from hard skills, skills, soft skills. I love that point, Carolyn, because I, just from a career advisor's perspective, I see that all the time, and I tell my students, um, you know, what one company is looking for when it comes to the technical abilities, another company may not be looking for the same thing. So one job might be requesting that you have extensive background in R, whereas another company might prefer Python. Um, but at the end of the day, that differentiating factor is going to be how well can you communicate, how curious are you are, and how well, you know, what 
do you have grit? You know, do you have what it takes to not give up on a problem when you're stumped? Because you will be stumped as data scientists a lot. So um, great points, you guys. Um, if so, let's just kind of pivot. Um, if somebody is new to data science and they're trying to get their foot in the door, um, how can they stand out amongst competition that has more experience? Or how can they show or demonstrate to an employer that they have value to add? <laughs> uh, so to me, a skill that is really valuable is, and I'd say this is probably maybe a difficult one to demonstrate in an interview, but I still think it's what makes you stand out, is being a constant skeptic of data. Um, I think of this as uh, starting at the, you know, as a data scientist, I need to see stuff from the large scale all the way down to the small scale. Because sometimes that really cool trend or feature that you think you found in a data set is a bug. And every time you find anything really interesting in a data set, ask yourself, what bug could have caused this? And go look for that bug. You should be able to go up to the big, big trend level and then zoom down to the tiny little detail level of the data. Um, and where you're actually looking at like an individual raw as you can get line entering and see if it's doing what you thought it was doing. Uh, whenever I'm working with new, relatively younger data scientists and they'll sell it, say things like, let me give you an example. Uh, we have a million social security numbers. And for some reason, 100,000 of them are only eight digits long. I immediately know why. <laughs> Maybe you do too. It's because social security numbers can start with a zero, and you read them in as an integer, and you drop the first zero. You like the ability to just immediately start going, that's odd. Let's go look at the data and figure out what's going on. Is what it's it's the hardest thing when someone first comes to the door to make sure that they're always doing every time, every time. Okay, just one more thing to this point would be I'll summarize. This is understanding the business for which you are working on that problem. Make sure you understand when you really go to the project. You know what is that business? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to achieve? What's the business model? As soon as you understand the business, it will help you in multiple fronts. Whenever you're trying to pick out a story out of the data, you'll understand why is this happening. Like she said, social security number eight digits, why is this happening? You know zero is something which is business-wise. If you're like a quant data scientist, you'll have no idea why the zero is coming on. But if you have a business understanding, it will help you. Number two, I would say, as long as you're working with the business people who take out your data, if you're part of that project end-to-end -end in the implementation plan, it will definitely give you a lot of edge because then you can suggest those things based out of this business from your data saying that this is the anomaly, these are the outliers, this is the problem you guys might not know. But if you start tapping into it, it could be a big change for those guys. Even sometimes pointing out those small things to the business could, be a bit, could mean a big thing for them. And the second point which I would say is don't just talk all the time. Do some proof of, proof of concepts. Use simplest implementation levers like a shiny app, a web app, even a PowerPoint deck or an Excel worksheet saying what the data is about and how can I summarize it would be a big thing for your managers to take it forward. Instead of talking, if you bring out something which can explain what it is, it would be a big thing for you guys, I would say. One thing, so this is, the, the, it's about like, the, the question, right, is about for people who, who are entry level and, and don't have, okay, yeah, so one thing like you, you shouldn't do, if I can get like an anti-answer is like, yeah. don't, like, don't just send somebody a GitHub repo and expect that they're going to like look at your source code. Um, and that's like a particular thing that is, it's not bad to have, it's great, you should have a GitHub repo and, and more to the point, you should have projects if you're new and you've worked on a project, like make sure there's something you can show like here's a visualization, here's like a tool, here's a, a unique data set that I scraped or whatever. Um, and and that's, that's like great tangible evidence of the thing you've done that maybe somebody else had not um, But yeah, if, if you just send a GitHub repo, I'm, like they're, the interviewer, you know, if you're seeing lots of resumes, you're probably not gonna start digging through someone's source code unless like you know, oh, this is a cool project they did they showed me this visualization, now I want to see how they built it. Like that, that process might happen, but it'll never be, like I'm never going to look at, at like uh, another person's source code unless I have to. But that's, maybe I'm lazy, but yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. 
But like, I, I have sent my GitHub repo to <coughs> potential employers before, and I'm certain they never looked at it. So. Yeah, that's a good point, Keith. And I'm glad that you brought up project work, too, because I think that's also really important. Just having an online presence. Employers like to see continued learning. You know, So if you recently graduated from a program and you're actively pursuing your first position in data science, you know, make sure that you are participating in those Kaggle competitions. Maybe you're blogging about it, um, you know, showing that you are continuing to do things to keep your skills fresh and sharp, I think it's really valuable. Um, what are you guys, or what are the skills needed to support changing business needs? Communication and politics. <laughs> Mic drop. Yeah, no, I, I would say like, um, wait, repeat the question again. Uh, what are the skills that you feel are needed to support changing business needs? Yeah, that that's um, <laughs> the the thing that I think is really important is that you understand the, the business you're working in, and um, you know don't let a like a prejudice you have for a certain tool or a certain model type or anything kind of prevent you from from pivoting, right? Like everybody learns plotting with their first plotting package and they can kind of attach to it. And then it's like, well, actually we need to create a different visualization. So like, uh, you know, be flexible and, and understand the business that you're supporting and let that guide your technology choices, your modeling choices, your, your um, you know, what inference you decide to do or not do. I think to add to that, don't get overwed to anything. Um, not just technology because you'll change to the jobs and they will have a different repo that they like to use or they will you know they may you know want to work in a different language um, you know I started my job and you know Python is my language of choice but it turned out that in a certain application we're really going to need to write everything in Scala okay so we're going to write everything in Scala we'll learn some Scala um, but also don't get overwed to models and to what the right way to solve a problem is because uh, for example I joined my team and uh, you know, within weeks of me joining the team, uh, what we're going to use the model to do and where it's going to fit in the pipeline, it all changed. And you know, I could sit in the corner and be like, okay, well, when you guys figure it out, I'll do some work. But it's much more being part of the conversation. Hey, where's the data going to come from then? Or hey, if you do this, you're going to you know, uh, make it so that the model can't possibly extract anything useful because you, you know, anonymized the one piece of information that has information in it. And so it's uh, a lot of being, I find it's a lot of uh, being the person in the room who can think about how does this impact the model? How does this impact what we're trying to do? How does this impact the model? Like being the, have the big data perspective of what, what, you know, you want your software to do X, Y, and Z, that's how that's gonna impact the model. Um, you as a business decision want to change what comes out of the model to do this, then we're using the wrong model. You're like the only person in the room who can tie all those things together. I'll take a different perspective. <clears throat> when I started my graduate studies at Northwestern, the first year director of the program says that whatever you're learning today in the next 15 months might not be applicable in the next five years. And we say, what? We just have not even started the studies yet. But that's true. What he said is that whatever we're teaching today are the foundation blocks that might help you learn whatever comes in the future. And to be honest, whatever is coming up next is so dynamic and so big. So you need to be very much agile and flexible. Whatever problems you face, you have, if you have the curiosity to learn and to solve those problems, like you build a model or a solution which you can optimize using something like Spark or let's like say Learn Scala, you'll actually go and read blogs, you'll find out relevant books, and you'll learn those things to solve those problems. To be honest, we learn those things next year. Deep learning is like a big thing these days. Probably five years now, something else comes up. Hadoop has been replaced by, let's say, Spark is coming up. There are so many things happening in the industry. You need to be really curious and kind of have this sense of wonder of what is happening. How can I improve my solution? And to be honest, there won't be anything like perfect data scientist. Everyone is focusing on some small aspect of it, and that's where they learn out. And whenever there is a new thing, if you really want to feel like you can improve and you can improve your company's ideas, business perspectives, you'll learn those things. And that's where always you'll be cutting edge and you'll improve those, let's say technology, improve those projects which you're working on. That would be my two thoughts on it. Right. 
Um, is this fast evolving discipline causing stress to its practitioners? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Depends what stresses you out. If, if, your pers if what you want is to like learn one set of quant skills, get a job and you know, exercise that set of quant skills for the rest of your life, yeah, you're gonna get stressed. Uh, if you're like, new tools are cool, and I could be the person who brings this into the room, and uh, that's kind of fun. I mean, the, maybe the stressful part is that you always know that maybe in a few months we're going to hire somebody, and they're going to bring in a skill I don't have. And that's yeah, a little stressful, but that's also an opportunity. Uh, so, it depends what stresses you. So, I would say like, what do you define with stress? Let me just say that. You are, you're on a project and you have lack of skills to understand the problem, to solve the problem, and at times you don't have adequate training, you get stressful because you don't know how to solve it, that's a problem. Second could be anything like you don't have good communication skills, like she said, communication and politics, definitely. If you cannot tell your manager or your team what are the real expectations, what you can do in this time would cause you stress. Third major thing would be you're in a company, you're given a responsibility, but you don't have authority to do that. It's gonna stress you out because you ask the DBA to give me data, he says, I don't have time for you. And you have to deliver something. So stress would be part of your job, as like a data scientist or anyone else, there would be stress in the job if you're not delivering your projects or delivering whatever you're expected to do that will cause you stress. You have to do something which you don't know, like you are supposed to work on Spark with Scala, you don't know what is Scala, it's gonna stress you out. So I would say stress is part of like any other job data scientist would have a lot of stress if he's not enjoying his work. As long as you are keeping yourself equipped with all what is required from this job and you are working on those things, doing it in a manner you enjoy it, you won't, you won't have stress out of it. Great. Based out of your experience, uh, what are personality traits of today's data scientists? I'll start. Three of them, I would say, dominant, like taking charge of things. <laughs> Being aggressive at times, that I need to get this thing done, I would be number one. Number second is influential, like social and communication skills are the key with whatever stakeholders, whatever teams you're working on. If you can collaborate with them other than just work and find out the sweet spots where you can enjoy discussions, take things forward, number two would be there. Number three would be steadiness, I would say like persistence. You get a problem, you solve that, and you're really on to the point of getting things done. Whatever it is, that would be really three keys, so I would say, Dominance, influential, and I would say steadiness, the three things which come to my mind. Yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, you, you say dominance, I'm going to say the opposite, which is you can't, it's hard to be shy and be successful because uh, you're never going to have a data set that, that uh, you have 100% of all the domain expertise that you need to understand it, which means you're going to have to go to somebody and you're going to have to say, what's that? And they're going to give you this long, jargony explanation, and you're going to go, uh-huh, uh-huh, no, I don't get it. Explain it again. Try again. What does that mean? I don't understand that. What, what does that word mean? And you're going to have to be persistent and annoying and be like, I'm okay being annoying because this is what I need to do to do my job. And you don't want to explain something to me, but I need you to, and I'm going to sit here in your office until I'm satisfied because this is what's going to take for me to do my job. Uh, you're going to have to be someone who's going to like be talking of a business person, and they're going to be like, uh, so can you guarantee me that the next trained model will have no differences in its results than the previous model? You're like, nope. <laughs> yeah, you have to be. You have to be a truth teller. You have to tell people things they don't want to hear, because that's just what the math says. Sorry. Uh, or you know, can we extract this result from the data? Nope. People did not record that information. We can't extract it. Uh, so a so I, you're going to call that dominance, and I guess I'm going to call that um, bluntness and being willing to be a little annoying to get the job done. Uh, and then definitely, I agree, persistence, um, being willing to like just dig, dig, dig until you understand. If you don't understand, if ever, if at any point, you see something in your data that doesn't make sense, you go, uh, yeah, but it's like go home time. And, I'll just back, you know, I'll look into that later. Whatever in your data didn't make sense will be the thing that three months down the line you will be paying for. So constantly being like, huh, does that make sense? Does this make sense? Until everything makes sense, you're not done. Yeah, I agree with that on a sort of less like intense tone. <laughs> um, there's one, one of my colleagues has a mug and it says try some shit. 
on it. And it's like, I think that the people that I admire most that I work with are really willing to just like try try some shit. You know, like if there's a problem and they don't know what they're doing, they're just gonna like try it. Like just, you know, being, again, this is my, my, my like, my own mantra is just like, <clears throat> try to be comfortable like you know regularly humiliating yourself with new problems and like you'll get better at it and um, and that's a personality trait that I've that I've noticed in people that I admire at least. So. And one other thing just to add from my experience is um, being a master summarizer can really help you go from ordinary to extraordinary. Your models and your data is going to tell you a lot of things right and um, as data scientists, you guys will find that really interesting and fascinating, but for some of us that aren't data scientists, we don't necessarily geek out on that stuff all the time. Um, and a lot of the constituents you'll talk to in the workplace are people who are non-technical, and they're not going to understand everything that you're telling them. So you have to really become masters at picking out the really important pieces that are going to make the most impact on the business. So I think um, you know that's a really good. I don't know if that's necessarily personality trait, but definitely a skill um, that that can go a long way. I think. Um, so I think now is a good time to turn it over to you guys in the audience, and if you have questions, yeah, well, good. Start over here. a lot of job titles, data scientist, business analyst, and the big modeler. So um, I just want to hear like about what's the differentiate uh, between those titles. Since I know a lot of like business analysts, they do the same thing like, uh, sounds like the same thing like they heard about from what they, uh, the stakeholders request. They bring stuff with the stakeholders and they do their business analysis or even model. And then later, they uh, do the visualization and then talk, up, uh, talk with the stakeholder who requests those analysis. So uh, definitely, the communication politics involved in this whole process. And uh, like, so what's the difference? Like, can you guys talk about like, what's the differentiate between the different titles, or even you guys work in the same, same company with, with your company's analysts? So what do you think the difference? So I think maybe yeah. job seeker looking for more details information about sure. that. Sure, kind of like the breakdown between the different types of positions, a data analysis or an analyst versus engineer versus scientist. Did, you want to say something? Yeah, I'll take a crack. But this this recently came up. Um, and this was like when I remember when I was first trying to get a job in data science, I found this particularly frustrating because the titles are not so clear. Um, we uh, at Civis we kind of we target our platform to a particular kind of data scientist. So we kind of came up with titles. We have um, business analyst types who are spending more time, you know, working in Excel or SQL or doing visualization. What we call operational data scientists, which are people that work in a company, um, you know, working with the company's proprietary data, building models internally in house as a data scientist. And then we, and then there's a third category we call production data scientists that are more focused on, they're closer to software engineers and they're working on building out tools or building out models. And so my, my job's kind of more like in between operational and production, but I think that there aren't good titles right now. And I think that this is like, this is actually like a, a problem in my perspective uh, with, with how people are um, trying to get new hires to come to them is that they'll call everything data science, even if it's like maybe even, you know, has a different, meaning than, than perhaps what the, the person reading the job post thinks. Yeah, I think I'd say um, in general, and this, this mic's louder. Um, in general, I'd say analysts um, are people, in my experience, who could rock a spreadsheet like you wouldn't believe. And that just, I did not, I did not appreciate like how you can rock a spreadsheet until I got to know some finance people. Um, but probably don't have a lot of deeper programming skills. Uh, and may not be able to create a, a prediction, a predictive model that could be used in some sort of a future going setting out of that. But they can tell you in depth about the past. Um, uh, the other title you're here is data engineer. Um, 
the skill of being able to set up a large database in, I don't know, Cassandra, Druid, Drool, Kafka, whatever, and get all the parts to talk to each other and be fast and all that. That is a, a big engineering skill set and I have friends who have it and that's not my skill set. Uh, data scientist is something more, it's, it, it, it kind of is halfway in between an analyst and a data engineer, uh, and which is why it can be a little frustrating trying to figure out. I mean, sometimes the best way to find out what a company is actually looking for is partially, is almost even less through the posting of the job itself and more through the part where you do an informational interview or talk to them about what the job is uh, because they, they, there is not strong, just, the titles are not as explanatory as they should be. Yeah, my career advisor answer is an analyst is somebody who's looking at archive data and trying to make sense of you know what has happened. A data scientist is trying to predict what will happen. And an engineer is kind of like the plumber. They're laying the pipes down and making it possible for that information and that data to flow. But realistically, you can't go by a title because at Google, they don't actually employ data scientists. But of course, they're doing data science. Um, so you have to really look at what the um, position entails um, more than anything. I think there was a question, yeah, over here. Go ahead. I wanted to find out how our intelligence impact the area of data science one and two in fairness to um, whenever you have politics you have ethics so can you please address that because I heard politics mentioned five times and ethics zero and we had a speaker this morning about regulatory and then the final area that I would like to comment on would be how is hyperledger in your field of financial interposed with data science uh, so because I'm the one who introduced the word politics, I'm going to address your question. Um, so I will first say that uh, the way in which I'm using the word politics is uh, tangential or orthogonal to ethics because I'm talking about understanding what people want. Not, and, I'm, and I guess the ethical side of that is being willing to give them the honest truth, even if it's going to mean you're, you're telling them they can't have what they want. So to me, it's, you know, uh, you know, I just started a new company. I've spent a lot of time meeting a lot of new people and trying to figure out who they are, what, what, what their interest is in the company, uh, what are they supposed to be delivering to their boss, um, and how they are interacting with the teams around them. That's the politics. Uh, the ethics, to me, the ethics as being a data scientist is uh, never claiming the data does or shows something that it doesn't, no matter what. Well, I'm a trained ethicist, and sometimes when you're looking at those words, you might want to consider that baked into your eliciting that information is you're building a framework that has at its center your core expertise in data analytics combined with an inherent understanding of what is the need or the point of pain that you talked about with your potential business partner or collaborator. It's a framework that you already come with an understanding of the rigorous science and the rigorous ethic. Yeah, so I don't know if this will address, I am not, an, I am not a trained ethicist, so this might not, this might totally miss your question, but I will try. Um, one thing that that we've been investigating. We do a lot of like modeling uh, people's behavior, and and one thing that is uh, coming up often is unbiased modeling. So sometimes, based off of select, like selection biases that came from the data set that you get, like you could imagine there there are machine learning algorithms that do like prison sentencing, and they take in a bunch of different covariates about the person who's committed a crime and their previous criminal history. And so thinking about like how can you measure whether a model is, uh, you know, recommending sentencing based off of, you know, protected class characteristics like race, and gender, and age, and things, um, people have started, I think, taking that question a lot more seriously. And so we have some folks that are spending a lot of time 
looking at like how do we measure biases in these models? What are ways you can correct for biases across you know protected class dimensions? Um, but it's a um, it's like a very important and relevant question. I don't know if that quite gets at what you're asking. Well, you handle the social side of data science, so I'm glad that you're looking at the unbiased because some of these points, these data points embedded in them could be very, very misunderstood information. And then again, the first question that I have, and I'm sure others would want to know, how is data science going to be impacted by AI? I'm just going to say with respect to AI, um, you can do some really interesting trying to figure out uh, what the difference is between AI and machine learning, all these things. These are really fuzzy titles and categories. Um, I've worked for companies where we were doing machine learning, but we advertised we were doing AI. It sounded better. Uh, I think, but I think that the truth is that there is fluidity in this, and there is there's, there are not too many algorithms that are solidly, this is definitely AI, and this is definitely not machine learning. So uh, that makes it hard to answer the question. Maybe I'll just give one example to clarify your problem. <clears throat> Let's suppose artificial intelligence is that there's a problem, a medical problem. Uh, algorithm would learn all the journals, all the research papers, and tell the doctor, for this problem, this is the solution, actually. This is kind of machine learning, which we do is we give recommendations, telling the doctor, these things have happened this way, and this is expected. AI would actually tell the doctor right away about all these logics that this is what you have to do. For example, driving a car, a self-driverless car, is artificial intelligence like what we define these days. In comparison, you're driving a car and the system is recommending you with this weather, you need to drive at this speed, and you need to make sure on this turn you turn left or right. Instead of driving the car by itself, driverless car, it versus something like where you're recommending the driver do these things to make sure you can reach the point safely. That's what I would use to differentiate AI versus what is data science and machine learning these days. You get it? All right, so we have time for one more question. Um, so we'll go over here, and then unfortunately we'll have to wrap up, but I know that I'm gonna be hanging around and I'm sure these guys will too. My question is about the future, and it really links to this AI question a little bit. Uh, data science is a really exciting field yeah, there is a lot of stuff that's going on, uh, but I wanted to ask the panel to look maybe five, ten years of the future, specifically for how the job market is going to be looking for data scientists maybe in five, ten years. Uh, this is a tricky question because I think that the, there's a triangle here, and the triangle uh, has you know, the following three aspects. Um, there is a huge growth in the amount of data that's emerging. We are collecting more and more data, so presumably there is a really increased need for more people to look at this data. And then the other part of the triangle is you have new technologies that are emerging. Some of those technologies are empowering, some of those technologies are actually replacing some of the stuff that data scientists used to do. And finally, there is increased a large number of programs. When previously, data science was a very niche profession where people would basically self-train themselves with data science. Now there are really great programs where you could you know, do a boot camp for 12 months, 12 weeks even, and become a, a very qualified data scientist. So could you guys talk about that? So something I like to remind people is when I graduated from college, the phrase data scientist did not exist. Um, so the job, and, and I didn't know at the time that that was the job that I'd ultimately be you know, the happiest in. Um, so you know, if, I had, if I had tried to, as an undergrad, uh, prepare myself for, for what I thought was the best career, the career I wanted didn't actually ha wasn't there yet. Uh, so I feel like uh, I am not the least bit concerned that the fundamental skills of being a data scientist are things that are going to get replaced by AI and automation and better tool sets. Uh, if, if you, if what you do as a data scientist is something that can get replaced that easily, then you're probably not a very good data scientist. You're just, you know, uh, someone who, I could, you know, grid search a model, you know. Uh, well, you know, being a data scientist is so much more than that, that the fact that, you know, you can run a grid search on, you know, better and faster and try all five different models or whatever tomorrow in, you know, one suite, it doesn't threaten what you do. Uh, so I feel like, the, 
the, the things that we've talked about of you know remaining curious, following the technology, staying on top of things, uh, just bringing that kind of skepticism and those skills. That stuff will never. That will always keep you at the top of this, at the, the front of this field. Uh, it's the I know my language. I'm always just going to work in this language, and if my language, you know, it, you know, if, if the languages that people wanted to write code in change, oh well, you know, that's the attitude where you're going to endanger yourself. Yeah, I'm. Um, I think it's a really good question, and I think that you highlighted some of a number of a number of the many factors that will influence like the job market for data scientists, and um, you know, part of Part of what I do is I'm, I'm doing some forecasting these days, and like five to ten years, like at a macroeconomic level, I think nobody can reliably produce prediction at that scale. Like I think it's I think there's a tremendous number of factors. I do think that Carolyn's right that like the core skills will probably persist and keep you employed, but <laughs> what that looks like, I have, I have no idea. I would not even attempt to venture a guess myself. But I'd like to just add one more thing to your point. You actually summarize a lot of things. One point which I believe in coming years, like she said, the core skills remain the same. For example, let's expect an algorithm comes and we don't have to train the model this much in the future. We just train it on a small bit of data and it works perfectly fine with bigger data sets. We just train model on a specific department in the company, it works fine for the other departments as well based on deep learning. These kind of skills will actually improve the kind of work which we are doing. Like at the moment you say we would do a lot of donkey working for data preparation, maybe in future we don't have to do that. These things will stay. But your level of competence and your level of coming out with insights would improve much better. There would be better hardware to understand something like a neural network. Human brain is being trying to mimic with electrical signals, lesser energy being used. These kinds of things will actually raise our competence level and getting more and more insights or I would say like more intelligence out of these systems. That's what you can expect. More of some of the jobs might be replaced, but then there will be a lot of more jobs coming in as well. But you'd have to be a better programmer. You'd have to be. Everyone would be need to need to know what's computer science and all that stuff. That would become core part of, like, let's say, undergrad, not even undergrad, high school or even below that. That everyone would know, would know how to use these things. That's what I see in next five to ten years. Great. Thanks for the great questions and thank you, panelists, for your expertise. Thank you. So